Hello and welcome to the History of the Germans, episode 149, The Real Ludwig of Bavaria, part of season 8, From the Interregnum to the Golden Bull. A few months after Emperor Henry VII had died in the Tuscan village of Juan Convento, and before a successor could have been elected, a young man, Ludwig, second son of the Duke of Upper Bavaria, made his name, defeating a much larger Habsburg force. This success could not have come at a more opportune time, as it propelled him into contention for the title of King of the Romans, and ultimately Emperor. His rule, constantly contested but lasting 33 years, would become a major turning point in German, if not European history, as it triggered the modern notion of the separation of church and state. And for fans of the name of the Rose, that's the background to the entire novel. Now I know that I cannot always maintain a completely unbiased position in this podcast, even though I try very hard. And I rarely succumb to my personal bugbears. But this time I will have to expose you to one of my biggest. And that is this weird romanticization of Ludwig II of Bavaria, that mentally ill recluse that built the three kitsch palaces of Neuschwanstein, Herrenchiemsee and Linderhof in the deluded hope of resurrecting an absolutist regime in a kingdom he had effectively sold to Prussia. Don't get me wrong, the three palaces are worth visiting, if not for their somewhat morbid charm, but what irritates me is that this politically and artistically inconsequential monarch overshadows the more interesting, the more complex and the more consequential Bavarian rulers and chief amongst them his namesake, Ludwig IV, the Bavarian. Let's see whether Hodgie Pot cannot write this misconception. But before we start, a big thank you to our one-time donation supporters. I've finally done the proper analysis over all of you and wow, some of you are extremely generous making multiple donations over time. And I want to thank specifically today Gary S, Dodo S, John C, Mary Jane H, Simon F, Stefan A and Wortbau for their generosity. And with that, back to the show. Now last week we ended with the untimely death of Emperor Henry VII from the House of Luxembourg. And even though he failed in his ambition to bring Italy to heel, his coronation as emperor had brought an end to the long period without emperors that began with the demise of Frederick II in 1250. Now a lot has happened in these 63 years and the power structures of Europe in general and the empire in particular had changed fundamentally. The epic struggle between popes and emperors had resulted in a papal triumph. Pope Boniface VIII had declared that it was paramount for the salvation of humanity that every monarch became subject to the pope. And it was that self-same pope that was brought back down to earth by physical force and his successor Clement V had moved to Avignon under the de facto supervision of the King of France. The Kings of France had not only captured the papacy, they had also consolidated their lands and had established a modern, in inverted commas, bureaucracy that gave them access to resources far, far larger than that of their eastern neighbours, the kings of the Romans. And so only the English kings and largest vassals of the King of France could contest their position. The empire, meanwhile, had fragmented. The lands north of the Main River had de facto succeeded out of the imperial orbit since the days of Henry IV and the investiture controversy in the 11th century, and by the 14th century they had only scant interest in the goings-on down south. They still fielded two electors, the Dukes of Saxony and the Markgrafs of Brandenburg, but both rarely attended elections and used their rights to elect mostly as a way to extract cash from the candidates. Italy, after Henry VII's failed attempt to bring it back under control, was now left to its own devices. The emperor still claimed nominal overlordship and would appoint imperial vicars and grand aristocratic titles, often against generous donations. But apart from going to Rome for coronations and the fights on the ways down and back, the emperors no longer saw Italy as a land that they could or should control. Within the core imperial territory that comprised modern-day southern Germany, the Rhineland, Austria, Switzerland and the Czech Republic – 
power had consolidated into three main families. The Habsburgs, the House of Luxembourg and the House of Wittelsbach. By 1313, Duke Frederick the Handsome of Austria, oldest son of King Albrecht I, together with his brother Leopold, was the head of the House of Habsburg. King John of Bohemia, son of Emperor Henry VII, together with his uncle Baldwin, the Archbishop of Trier, was the head of the House of Luxembourg. The House of Wittelsbach was led by two brothers, Rudolf, the Count Palatinate on the Rhine, and his brother Ludwig, the Duke of Upper Bavaria. If things had followed the pattern of the last decades, we should now see one of the archbishops pull a minor and threatening looking territorial lord out of his mitre who would sign all sorts of promises and would then be elected king. But that was no longer the case. For one, the concept of electing poor counts hadn't exactly worked out. Each of these allegedly malleable rulers had broken all of their promises and then leveraged their royal position to acquire major imperial fiefs, and two had really succeeded. Rudolf von Habsburg had captured Austria for his sons, and Henry of Luxembourg had gained Bohemia for his. Moreover, the three houses now held three of the seven electoral votes between them, Bohemia, Trier and the Palatinate. Hence the time of the election of small counts was over. If one was to become king, it had to be someone from these three families. The Habsburgs and the Luxembourgs each had a go already. The Habsburgs even had two. The Wittelsbachs had tried three times and three times had been kicked out in the early rounds. Spoiler alert, in 1313 it was the Bavarians' turn, though second spoiler alert, it did not go at all smoothly. But before we get to the election itself, it is time to get to know the Wittelsbachs, the third of these powerful families a little better, in particular their champion, Ludwig, the Duke of Upper Bavaria. Therefore, let's start at the beginning. If you come to Munich today and you look for the seat of the Bavarian dukes and kings, you will be directed to the Residenz, the largest inner city royal palace in Germany, comprising six major courtyards, theatres, concert halls, an impressive hall of antiquities, a file of Rococo state rooms, a treasury, museums, etc., etc., pp. None of that existed in 1313. At that time, the Dukes of Upper Bavaria resided in what is today called the Alte Hof, the Old Court, a much more modest affair, tucked away two blocks away from the residence, and inside the old court you find a small tower, called the Monkey Tower, that allegedly could have put an end to the story of Ludwig the Bavarian before it had even begun. The story goes that the ducal family kept a pet monkey, and that monkey took a liking to baby Ludwig, and one day when a negligent servant left the window of the nursery open, the monkey snuck in and took the little prince. Once the nannies and servants realized what had happened, they tried to wrestle the baby away from the monkey. The frightened monkey fled and climbed up to the top of the monkey tower, still holding the precious little prince. It took hours for the ducal household to calm down the terrified animal and curse it and the baby boy back down to the ground. Ludwig was unharmed. The fate of the monkey is unknown, largely because the story is entirely invented and the tower the tourist guides point out was built much later. But it is a cute story and I did not want to deprive you guys of it. In particular because up to Ludwig the Bavarian, his family, the House of Wittelsbach, had been a touch short of cute stories. The Wittelsbachs had been an important family in Bavaria since the 11th century, and they made a huge leap forward in 1180 when Otto von Wittelsbach, the hero of the Battle of the Veronese Klause and loyal paladin of Emperor Frederick Barbarossa, was enfiefed with the Duchy of Bavaria that had recently been vacated by Henry the Lion. By then, the ducal position mirrored that of the Empress, in as much as the Duke would generate some modest income from the rights and the lands and the privileges associated with the ducal title but was mainly dependent upon his own resources when it came to maintaining his court and to fund military adventures. 
So when Otto became duke, his circumstances did not change quite as fundamentally as one may think. It was Otto's son, Ludwig I, known as the Kielheimer, who laid the foundation of the wealth of the Wittelsbachs. Kielheimer was a supreme tactician and a very lucky man. For one, he benefited from the demise of several important Bavarian families, whose fiefs he seized on account of his ducal rights and then kept hold of them on account of his superior military forces. His fortunes improved further when the death of Emperor Henry VI flung the empire into a civil war. The Kielheimer played each side against the other very smartly and walked away with the title of Count Palatinate on the Rhine, which made the House of Wittelsbach one of the electors. When his cousin, another Otto von Wittelsbach, murdered King Philip of Swabia, far from being accused of collusion, the Kielheimer was able to seize the possessions of this other branch of the family. All that meant that by 1230 the Wittelsbachs had become one of the most powerful families in southern Germany alongside the Hohenstaufen, the Kings of Bohemia and the Dukes of Austria. 1230, as it happened, was also the year the Kielheimer was murdered weirdly in Kielheim, the place of his birth, by a man of foreign appearance who was unable to give his name, let alone the name of his client, on account of being torn to pieces by the enraged crowd. Fingers pointed at Emperor Frederick II. One of the Kielheimer schemes had upset the emperor, who had close links to the Middle East and was rumoured to be a friend of the old man of the mountain, the head of the assassins. Whether or not he ordered the hit, well, we will never really know. The Kielheimer's son, Otto II, became known as the Illustrious. What made him key to this story, apart from his splendid court and another round of territorial acquisitions, was called the First Bavarian Division of 1255. One of the most devastating things that could happen to a powerful aristocratic family in the 13th and 14th century was to have a lot of male heirs and then forgetting to send most of them away to be churchmen. Because, contrary to the perception that all these duchies and territories were states, the holders of these titles regarded them as private property. And since the salient law applied only in parts of the empire, many families, including the Wittelsbachs, would split their lands amongst their surviving sons. And that is what happened in 1255. Otto the Illustrious had two sons, and so the Duchy of Bavaria was divided into two parts, the Duchy of Upper Bavaria and the Duchy of Lower Bavaria. The older son, another Ludwig, got Upper Bavaria and the Palatinate, whilst the younger one received Lower Bavaria. Now this Ludwig, Duke of Upper Bavaria, was the father of our Ludwig and the first Bavarian ruler who made Munich his main residence. Ludwig was known as Der Strenge, which translates as The Severe. This moniker goes back to an event in his youth when he had his beautiful young wife, Marie of Brabant, executed because he suspected her of infidelity. It turned out that this was a misunderstanding, but by that time her head was already in the basket. Ludwig, to his credit, became stricken with remorse, founded the monastery of Fürstenfeld, and promised never ever to kill another wife. And he stuck to that promise, and his next wife died of natural causes, after which he married Mechthild von Habsburg. Wind back, Ludwig and his brother Henry had been both candidates at the election of 1273, but they had to concede to Rudolf von Habsburg pretty quickly. So the marriage to Mechthild was part of Rudolf von Habsburg's charm offensive that paved the way to his election. Mechthild von Habsburg gave Ludwig the Severe five children, of which two sons, Rudolf, born 1274, and then the focus of this episode, Ludwig, born most likely in 1282. As so often with individuals in the pre-modern period, we know next to nothing about Ludwig's childhood and upbringing. It is likely that he had spent the first seven years of his life under the supervision of his mother. And once children had reached the age of seven, they were considered old enough to begin preparation for their future occupations. Children of burghers would go to school, whilst peasants' children would be expected to earn their crust in the fields or as servants in the manor house. 
the son of a duke would be educated in war, hunting and tournaments, as well as the art of courtly love. War, hunting and tournaments played a huge role in the social and political interactions of the territory lords and their vassals, and hence Ludwig was clearly expected to excel in all of these. But hitting things hard wasn't the only thing that mattered. By this time, a man of Ludwig's status would be expected not only to be able to read and write, but also to be familiar with poetry and chivalric romances. Many of Ludwig's fellow aristocrats, all the way up to the Emperor Henry VI, even wrote poetry themselves. Now, since he had not been destined for a role in the church, he did not learn much Latin or theology, but he had enough to recite the main prayers in Latin and probably understood roughly what they meant. So, apart from the dramatic thing with the monkey, Ludwig's childhood was rather uneventful. All that changed when his father died in 1294. Ludwig is at that point 12 years old. His brother Rudolf is 19. As an adult, Rudolf had already set up his own court and had taken on some of the burdens of the ruler alongside his father. Given the Wittelsbach propensity to treat the surviving sons equally, Rudolf and Ludwig were supposed to manage their lands, the Palatinate and Upper Bavaria, jointly. But since Ludwig was a minor, Rudolf demanded that he would be made a guardian of his brother, meaning that in effect Rudolf would run the place all by himself. And that attempt fell at the first hurdle, which was the mother of the two dukes, Mechthild von Habsburg. Mechthild feared that Rudolf would push Ludwig aside, or worse, and she was not letting that happen. Mechthild had been appointed young Ludwig's guardian and co-regent by the old duke, and she insisted on having her say. So to protect young Ludwig, she sent him away, to the court of her brother, Albrecht, then still only Duke of Austria, but well on his way to become King of the Romans. In Vienna, little Ludwig grew up with Albrecht's two sons, Frederick the Handsome and Leopold. I know there are again a lot of names in this episode, but you may want to remember these two. Frederick the Handsome and Leopold of Austria. Again, we do not know anything about Ludwig's time in Vienna, so we can only speculate that his training in the chivalric skills continued. And Vienna was surely a great place to do that, in particular once Albrecht had become King of the Romans in 1298. Whilst Ludwig's relationship with the Habsburgs grew closer and closer, his brother Rudolf shifted out of the orbit of his cousins. Rudolf, who had been Count Palatinate and hence one of the electors, had voted for Adolf von Nassau as king, and had thereby denied Albrecht von Habsburg the crown at his first attempt. And then Rudolf married the daughter of King Adolf von Nassau, putting him firmly into the anti-Habsburg camp. At the Battle of Gölheim, where Albrecht defeated and killed King Adolf von Nassau, Rudolf had fought on the losing side of his father-in-law. Still, Albrecht treated his cousin Rudolf with kindness, and Rudolf attended Albrecht's coronation. But soon afterwards, the relationship soured again. Rudolf attempted to overthrow Albrecht together with the Rhenish archbishops. But Albrecht besieged and captured Heidelberg, and Rudolf had to submit to the king's mercy again. Rudolf is a fascinating personality in as much that literally every single one of his many, many schemes failed. And despite all these failures, he kept going and going and going. After his latest defeat, he went into a sulk. And that sulk turned into an all-out rage when the victorious King Albrecht demanded that Rudolf accepted the now 19-year-old Ludwig as his co-ruler in the Palatinate and in Upper Bavaria, as had been set out in his father's last will and testament. Now, he was unable to do anything against that royal order, but what he could do is turning against his own mother. Mechthild von Habsburg had been defending Ludwig's rights these last seven years, and Rudolf assumed that it was her who was behind the royal demand to let the little brother get his share of the inheritance. And for that, Rudolf really hated her. 
he had her and her key advisor, Konrad Oettlinger, arrested and brought to Munich. There she was accused of interfering in the running of the duchy and was ordered to hand back her mourning gift, the traditional gift of land that she had received upon her marriage from her husband. She refused. Rudolf then had her advisor, Konrad Oettlinger, executed. Mechthild still refused. Rudolf went one further and publicly accused his mother of having had a sexual relationship with Oettlinger. It all turned into a rather unpleasant scandal. Under this enormous pressure, Mechthild agreed to hand over her lands and rights to Rudolf and live out her life on a small pension somewhere in the remote countryside. But, as a frail woman, she would need to get this agreement confirmed by her brother, King Albrecht, before she could sign it. Rudolf understood and let her go, and once she was safely at her brother's court, Albrecht turned on Rudolf, declared this agreement null and void, returned everything to Mechthild and gave the scheming Count Palatinate a right old rollicking. After all we know about Rudolf now, this kind of treatment was neither going to discourage him from pursuing further schemes, nor was it going to improve his relationship with the Habsburg. But things trundled along reasonably well, the two brothers ran the territory jointly, though Rudolf probably had a lot more control of the levers of power, having been in charge for a decade already. Things took a dramatic turn, when, as we know, King Albrecht von Habsburg was murdered in 1308, and that led to the election of Henry VII, where the two brothers had initially harboured a hope that it may now finally be their turn. But that hope had vanished rapidly. They did fall in line with everyone else, and it was actually Rudolf who declared Henry VII emperor-elect. After this election, Rudolf became a strong supporter of the Luxembourgs, while Ludwig took a more neutral pro-Habsburg stance. At the same time, he decided that this co-ruler thing did not work anymore. He proposed to Rudolf that they should split the Duchy of Upper Bavaria between each other. The way they did that was actually quite fascinating. The brothers summoned their friends and relatives, including Duke Otto of Lower Bavaria, Frederick the Handsome, Duke of Austria, Duke Henry of Carinthia, four bishops and a brace of Bavarian counts. This commission was to split the duchy into two equal parts and then the two brothers would draw lots who would get which part. The whole thing was completely absurd. Let's start with the fact that Frederick the Handsome and the Duke of Lower Bavaria were in the middle of a hot war with each other, whilst at the same time they worked happily together on this commission. Henry of Carinthia had been expelled as King of Bohemia by his Habsburg cousins, and Rudolf supported the Luxembourgs in their scheme to remove him again from Prague. Still, Henry of Carinthia was on the commission. Suffice to say that the inhabitants of these lands, the city councils and parishes, had absolutely no say whatsoever in this decision that may cut them off from their neighbours, their trade routes and their long-standing allies. Still, these kinds of processes weren't at all unusual in that period. The only way to understand what is going on here is to look at the alternative. And that alternative was to settle the conflict by feud. And a feud would have a much more painful impact on the local population than a decision by a panel of local magnates, even if they were completely out of touch. And as for the fact that some members of the panel were actually at war with each other, it helps to regard these feuds not as wars, but as legal disputes. Hence Frederick the Handsome could be in a legal disagreement with the Duke of Lower Bavaria, but that was not a personal vendetta, just some kind of a commercial dispute with swords. And hence these two men could still cooperate with each other on issues like the division of Upper Bavaria. Nothing personal, just business. Though the protagonists did often harm and sometimes even kill each other in these feuds, but then so do Mafia Dons. As you would expect, the separation of the duchy into two parts did not lead to a rapprochement between the brothers. The ink was barely dry on the agreement and the two of them were already at odds about the interpretation of this or that. So they gathered their followers and burned each other's lands in an attempt to force the respective other side to accept their well-grounded legal arguments. What brought this feud to an end was the departure of Henry VII to Rome and his son John's departure for Bohemia. 
Rudolf, as a supporter of Henry VII, first joined John and then caught up with the Emperor in Pisa. I think last episode I called Rudolf Robert by mistake. So, Rudolf, Count Palatine on the Rhine and Duke of one half of Upper Bavaria, spent the next two years with Henry VII in Italy, gaining much praise for his street fighting skills in Rome, and he cut a fine figure at the farce of a siege of Florence. Rudolf's passion for supporting the emperor did, however, wane a bit when he asked for some sort of monetary compensation for all his efforts. Henry VII, completely broke by this time, said, well, no can do, to which Rudolf responded, well, no can I, and he returned home. Once Rudolf had returned to Munich, he found the landscape profoundly changed. His little brother had used his time wisely. For one, he got married. And then he had gotten closer to his cousin and neighbor, Duke Otto of Lower Bavaria. Otto and Ludwig had already been joint guardians of Otto's nephews, another set of dukes of Lower Bavaria. Maybe a quick word about this inflation in ducal titles. Since the ducal title was no longer referred to an actual office, if a duke would split his lands between his sons, each of these sons would typically receive the title of duke. Occasionally, that ducal title would even pass to all the sons, even if they held no land in their own right. And in Bavaria, that had meant that by 1312 there were a total of five dukes of Bavaria, two dukes of Upper Bavaria, Ludwig and Rudolf, and three dukes of Lower Bavaria, whose names you really do not need to hear. The same happened in many other duchies, particularly in Saxony and Brunswick, plus the regular elevation of counts to dukes, and you can easily see why there have been hundreds, some say even a thousand ducal titles at the same time in the empire. And that's a very, very different situation to England, where there's always only one son who inherits the title, so that there were usually only about a dozen or so dukes, and sometimes just two or three. Now back to Ludwig and his cousin Otto, one of the three dukes of Lower Bavaria. Sad Otto really liked Ludwig, and so he made him the guardian of his son should he suddenly and unexpectedly pass away, which he then duly did. So Ludwig was now the guardian of all the three dukes of Lower Bavaria, which made him the de facto ruler down there. That, together with his own half of the Duchy of Upper Bavaria, made him now a lot richer and a lot more powerful than his hated brother Rudolf. And guess what? Rudolf did not like this one bit and came up with another one of his brilliant schemes. He noticed that there were many in Lower Bavaria who hated the Habsburgs and therefore disliked Ludwig, who had been a great friend of the Habsburgs. These Lower Bavarians were easy prey for even the rather modest charms of Rudolf. Now, the growing unrest in Lower Bavaria put Ludwig into an uncomfortable situation. If he remained an ally of the Habsburgs, he may lose control of the Duchy of Lower Bavaria, and worse, would lose it to his nasty brother Rudolf. The alternative was to break with the Habsburgs, which would tie the Lower Bavarians to him. But since the Habsburg may then retaliate, this option would require a reconciliation with his brother as well. Quite surprisingly, Ludwig chose option two. He kissed and made up with his brother and retained control of Lower Bavaria. He even got a really good deal with his brother. The division of Upper Bavaria was reversed, a common administration was established, and Rudolf, whose heir had died, gave everything over to Ludwig except for the rank as elector. So everything was fine now, right? Well, no, it wasn't. The Habsburgs had interests in Lower Bavaria for a long, long time, and Ludwig's U-turn away from them did not go down well. They glad-handed the nobility of Lower Bavaria and even got to the mothers of Ludwig's wards. These ladies offered the guardianship over the young dukes and hence control of Lower Bavaria to the Habsburgs. Frederick the Handsome and his cousin Ludwig who had grown up together, met on the castle of Landau to resolve the conflict. But as so often in the Middle Ages, one or both lost their temper and negotiations ended in a shouting match. In good old Wittelsbach fashion, Ludwig was about to go after Frederick the Handsome with sword in hand. 
the Habsburg and his retinue retreated before serious harm could be done, which put an end to negotiations. As soon as he was out of arrow shot, Frederick accepted the guardianship of the lower Bavarian dukes and war was on between the Habsburgs and the Wittelsmarks, two of the three most powerful families in the empire. On the Habsburg side, Frederick the Handsome was the eldest brother but by no means the most competent or impressive. His younger brother Leopold was the brains and the brawns behind the enterprise. And there you can also see the big difference between the Habsburgs and many of the other great German houses. The Habsburgs stuck together, at least most of the time. Leopold was certainly aware that he was the smarter one, but he remained loyal to his older brother in the interest of the Habsburg family. No divisions of land or wars between the two, as we have seen amongst the Wittelsbachs. And because they did not fight with each other, the Habsburgs had a lot more resources than the Wittelsbach brothers, and they started to bring them to bear. Frederick, who ran Austria, assembled an army to lead into Upper Bavaria, whilst Leopold put together a second force that was to come up from the Habsburg possessions in Switzerland and Alsace. That made the situation extremely precarious for the two Wittelsbachs. Ludwig and Rudolf were skinned. Rudolf had spent huge amounts of money on Henry VII's wars in Italy and received nothing in return. Ludwig was a bit of a profligate anyway, but had spent quite a bit bailing out the dissolute finances of Lower Bavaria. Still, Ludwig gathered a meaningful force in part from the cities in Bavaria who, as we will find out, were his greatest supporters, as well as amongst his nobility and other knights and princes who were opposed to the Habsburgs. But still Ludwig's army was far too small to take on the combined forces of Frederick the Handsome and Leopold. So the strategic imperative was to prevent the two enemies from joining. The first column to arrive in Bavaria was the army of Frederick the Handsome, which comprised a large number of nobles from Lower Bavaria alongside the Austrian and Hungarian forces that had come up from Vienna. The two armies met at Gammelsdorf. 60 kilometers northeast of Munich, near the city of Landshut. What happened next has become part of Bavarian mythology, in particular for the cities of Landshut, Moosbach, Straubing and Ingolstadt that had provided the majority of the infantry in this battle. It is certain that Ludwig's forces were much smaller than the Austrian contingent, at least those the Habsburg commanders could see. Some chronicles tell us that there was fog in the morning which may have helped Ludwig to hide major reinforcements in the flanks of the battlefield. As so often in these late medieval battles, the build-up to the fighting was an elaborate process governed by the laws of chivalry. Once the two armies were close enough to engage, it was customary that the party that felt superior to send envoys and ask whether the enemy would accept a battle. And the opponent was then perfectly entitled to decline and walk off the battlefield, and would often do so if they felt their forces were too small or their position unfavorable. If both sides accepted the engagement, either side would be given time to say mass, make their peace with God, put on their armor, and line up of battle, a process that could take several hours. But the 14th century armor had already become very elaborate, though the classic plate armor you see in castles had not yet been widely used by the beginning of the 14th century. Once both sides were ready and good to go, they lined up across from each other and then rode at full tilt at each other, hoping to break the enemy lines. Foot soldiers, Hungarians and Cumans on the Habsburg side and the city militia on Ludwig's end were usually only employed at the start of the fighting. However, some historians have argued that it was here at Gammelsdorf that common soldiers had for the first time a major impact on fully armoured riders by using precursors of the halibuts. Whether that is true is hard to ascertain given the paucity of sources, though in Landshut many make a big deal out of it. What is very much clear though is that Ludwig did win the engagement, either because of the halberds or because of the reinforcement that attacked the flanks, or both. Archaeological evidence nevertheless suggests that it wasn't a particularly bloody battle, and chroniclers mainly talk about 
the large number of prisoners Ludwig made. Still, the defeat of the mighty Habsburgs by this young and underpowered Duke of Bavaria, whose brother, by the way, was nowhere to be seen, created big waves across the empire. Ludwig's name was suddenly on everyone's lips as another case of David versus Goliath. And what impressed them even more was the aftermath. Ludwig met with his childhood friend Frederick the Handsome and they quickly re-established the old report. In a bout of generosity, Henry then released all the prisoners without a ransom, an almost unheard of act, in particular for a completely cash-strapped duke like Ludwig. But still, if as many historians believe today, this had been a significant engagement, but not a major battle, Gamelstorf would have been replaced in the news cycle by other battles within a few months or years. The reason the battle was not forgotten had to do with Henry VII having died in Italy just a few months earlier, and subsequently the usually painfully protected election process was now underway. At the outset it looked like a two-horse race. Who was it to be? Frederick the Handsome, the head of the House of Habsburg, or John? the son of the recently deceased Emperor Henry VII and King of Bohemia. Will the electors allow a son to immediately follow his father for the first time in more than a century? Or will they let the ambitious and acquisitive Habsburgs have a third bite at the cherry? Let's take a look at the electors. It all seems pretty promising for John of Bohemia. He has three votes pretty much in the bag. His uncle Baldwin, the Archbishop of Trier, and the brother of the unfortunate Henry VII is clearly going to vote for him. Then there's the Archbishop of Mainz, Peter von Aspel, who is a close ally of the Luxembourgs and the man who had brought John onto the throne of Bohemia. And then there's John, who, as King of Bohemia, can vote for himself. So that makes three votes for Luxembourg. All they need is a fourth one. On the Habsburg side, it was the Archbishop of Cologne, not because of some sort of family ties, but because he had fallen out with his colleague in Mainz. That was all. As for the remaining electors, one of whom was Rudolf von Wittelsbach, the question was not so much which one was the least worst option, but whether there was an alternative, and maybe even more importantly, who paid the largest bribes. And do not forget, there are two powers in the background that had so often had their hand on the scales these last decades. The King of France and the Pope. Who would they like to push? Will the King of France try his own candidate again? To make things more complicated, there is also the question, who were the electors? Like in Bavaria, some of these electoral titles had been split between different lines of the family, and either could claim the right to vote. Others, like King John of Bohemia, had only recently expelled the previous title holder, who may now come back on his old ticket. This became one of the most complex and most convoluted elections in the history of the Holy Roman Empire. But by now, you know the runners and riders. Ludwig and Rudolf of Bavaria, Frederick the Handsome and Leopold of Austria, John of Bohemia and his uncle, Baldwin of Trier. I hope you will join us again next week when we look at the horse trading and watch as two sets of electors elect two kings of the Romans at two different ends of the city of Frankfurt. And, as usual, I would like to remind you that the history of the Germans is advertising free thanks to the generosity of our patrons. And you can become a patron too by signing up at patreon.com slash historyofthegermans or by making a one-time donation at historyofthegermans.com slash support. Thank you all so much.